So this Linux for Beginners is really to teach you how you stop coming to Linux, installing a couple distributions, and then going right back to Windows or Mac or whatever you typically use for a daily driver. I use all of them, so there's nothing wrong with any operating system. It's just different strokes for different folks. And I will just say, I want to teach you how to make a Linux desktop look amazing and understand all the components. I'm gonna walk through a couple images on the screen real fast, just so you get an idea of like Mint to a KDE style to a fully customized one like I personally use. And I've used a bunch of them differently. And I want to teach you the ways and the components the things that you like and don't like about Linux to switch them out to all the things. Uh, that said, when it comes to what is a Linux beginner, I would say if you're not technically savvy to use Windows or Mac and have a pretty good understanding of those, Linux isn't for you. It's for technical people to really want to customize and make an amazing computing experience. Because I will say with Windows and Mac, I'm pretty bored. I understand all the problems and limitations they have. With Linux, I'm just, it, it's limitless. There's so much to do that I just fell in love with computing. And that's why I mainly use Linux for my daily driver, even though I edit videos on a Mac and I, I record on Windows for a variety of different reasons, mostly hardware uh, compatibility and some of the stuff that I use. It just makes, you know, use the right tool for the right job kind of thing. So that all said, let's get on the desktop, start installing Linux and kind of walk you through all the different customization you can do. So for this, I have a little article on ChrisTitus.com, Linux for beginners. Uh, we're gonna go through the install using Linux Mint, but you can use any distribution and you don't have to use Mint. We're just gonna use it as an example because it's a good starting point for a beginner. Uh, you just burn, the download, the ISO that you get from Linux Mint or your distribution of choice using Belina Etcher, or if you're a Windows user, Rufus is probably my preferred one, but either one is good. And then we're gonna go through some of the things you can change where in Mac, you're stuck with Finder, in Windows, you're pretty much stuck with Explore. You can add programs on top of it, but you can never really remove Explore. In Linux, all that's different. So we'll go through all the different types of file managers, uh, different theming options, depending on the desktop environment you have, remote access, uh, terminals, all these things are really, really an integral part of just understanding what doors you can open for Linux. And then we'll go into some limitations and Windows app alternatives that you might do. Uh, so Adobe, uh, just to exclude some folks right out of the gate, if you are using like a Creative Suite, Photoshop, Premiere, you know, uh, After Effects, all these are just no-goes in Linux. If you use these and you use them every day for your work, Linux is not for you. Uh, likewise, if you're huge into like Microsoft Office and you use a lot of macros and really advanced features, maybe not. Now, this is not such a thing because of the development of Microsoft Office Online. Uh, G Suite is amazing. So I use a lot of my tools, Office tools, through the web browser these days, but Linux does have some other alternatives albeit a little bit uh, not, not as powerful, I would say, as the Microsoft alternative. And then finally, we'll touch on gaming. And that's just the overview. Check down below for timestamps. And we're going to start with downloading old Linux Mint right here. Click download, grab your ISO, stick it on a USB drive using Belina Etcher, which you can get here. This works on Mac, Windows, Linux. So whatever you're using, you can easily uh, stick your USB drive like this, right into your computer, flash that ISO, and we'll meet you right on the install screen. Okay, so we've booted into our install media. We'll just say start Linux Mint. This puts us in what's called a live environment. This is where we can kind of learn about it without destroying what's on the computer already. So if you have Windows, you can get in here and mess around. Try these things out I do in the videos and see if it's right for you. So that's what you do. So I say, get familiar with terminal. This is one of those things where if you're in terminal, this is something every Linux user will do, whether it's installing a program like NeoFetch, just so you can show off to your friends and look like an amazing hacker. Uh, it's just 
There's so much to do in Terminal to make this even better. Uh, so Terminal is probably the first thing, and there's so many different types of Terminals. Figure out which one you like the best, which we'll go into. We have our files, how you actually browse a Linux install is really interesting. I did an entire video, but you don't necessarily have to watch that too long. Didn't watch of that is if we look at our title bar and we go to our root folder right here, this is like my computer in Windows, uh, just a structured in an NIX type system. If you're a Mac user, you're gonna like, oh yeah, 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 Macs are just like this. Uh, just a little different with like applications and some extended properties. But for Linux, uh, everything's here. I'm not gonna explain every folder because you really don't need to know too much other than USR does not stand for user. That's system resources. Root is the pseudo or super user home uh, directory. Home is where most of your files reside. You go to download something, it's usually the, the folder, the user, and then it sticks it in downloads. So that's the structure for most part. ETC is our configuration files for the system. So usually if the program gets configured system-wide, it's in ETC directory. Devices is basically what dev is. These are physical devices that you can reference through the dev folder. And then boot is usually where all your boot files are. Finally, bin is just a sim link. Uh, same with sbin down here uh, to all the programs in your system. So that's that's the actual folder structure, why it's like that. Uh, so if you're coming from Windows, this is probably the biggest shock to you because you're used to like C drive with like users and all this other stuff. Uh, just know that for the most part, everything you know is going to reside in the home folder. I just wanted to explain those other folders outside of it, just in case uh, you need a reference point. In your home folder, anytime you configure a program, typically they will put it into something called .config. You'll notice you don't see the .config because the dot before it hides that folder. So this is where all your user configure files will actually go. So don't worry too much about that. That's the folder structure. Just know your home folders where all the goodness resides. Browse around in here, fool around with settings, all these things. This is like a control panel. Every desktop environment typically has like a system setting like this that you can take advantage of. Now you don't necessarily need everything in your system settings. This is just a good uh, way to do it without having a breakout terminal for everything. But everything in Linux is mint from server first and then desktop stuff gets kind of added on. In Mac and in Windows, typically it's the other way around. So the user experience can be a little bit less stable in the Linux realm because of this. But just know that themes and all this stuff, you can do so much with uh, this. You can download new themes. Let's change some of this, switch it out to like Adapto Moto, and you can switch all these settings so easily compared to many other operating systems. As you see, we, we've almost got like a completely new look in just a short amount of time, which is kind of amazing. But before we theme this out too much, we are just working off of our USB drive. If we reboot, any of these customizations are completely lost. So we're gonna actually install Linux now. Uh, and this only takes about two minutes. It's actually a pretty easy install. You just do your language. Uh, typically you always wanna install anything that says non-free media codecs. This just makes your life a little easier. You typically wanna dual boot where you do something else and have multiple disks in your system. That's preferred. Uh, but if you do erase and install, typically this will wipe out your existing Windows system. So be careful about this. Make sure you back up anything before you actually install by erasing a disk with data on it. Seems pretty easy. Most people know this, but thought I'd point it out. And then we're time zone. We'll set our user, do a, a quick password, and continue this out. So it's 1741. Usually this will only take about two minutes and I will just skip forward. Okay, that took about three minutes actually, or two and a half, a little bit longer. Uh, if I was doing it on bare metal, I probably could get this down to two minutes. Now we just simply restart and this should boot into our Linux Mint for the first time. And here we are, we're presented with our login screen. This is actually called a display manager, but think of it as a login manager. You can actually select different uh, desktop environments, which we're gonna get into. 
let's log in and see what we get from the stock settings. All right. Uh, this is a nice little welcome screen from Mint. I don't get too attached with Mint because a lot of these things will change as uh, we go about customizing. But I do like the fact they give you a really good suite of software. That's really what a distribution does. So if you really like how they do system snapshots with time shift, install time shift on whatever distribution you're using. The drivers work differently between Linux and Windows. Windows actually installs drivers and it's a different type of kernel or basically the brain of operating systems. And Linux kind of has all these baked in. So typically you just plug it in and your device either works or it doesn't. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but for the most part, that's the truth. So uh, <laughs> you can get certain proprietary blobs for Wi-Fi. That's probably the biggest thing. But for the most part, there's no real drivers to download. So I really don't like that the Mint team installed driver manager, which it's not really a thing. Uh, update manager is something that's just a front end to the package manager that any distribution uses. System settings, we already, already went over. Software manager is something that pretty much every Linux install does poorly. Mint probably does a better job than most, uh, but at the same time, it, a lot of times you'll go to install a more obscure package in here and it'll fail and just won't tell you why. Uh, so I don't really ever use software manager if this is your first time using Linux. I would say browse around, figure out, okay, what are the different graphics things and all this. The beauty of Linux is all this is free. You're not paying for anything. Uh, almost all of it's free and open source, which is even better. But uh, for that, uh, I'll probably install GIMP, but I'm gonna use command line instead of showing you how to click the install button, just because it'll actually be useful to you. The very first thing we do with any operating system install, whether it's Windows, Mac, Linux, you do an update. So apt update, type that in, go out, update your stuff. Uh, now you can do the update manager if you want, but I want to teach you this way because it's stuff that you'll be able to take to any Linux install. If it's a Debian, Ubuntu, Pop! OS, elementary, everything uses what's called APT. That's the package manager that will update your system, install new programs, remove programs, hold programs back. All of it runs through apt, which is pretty good. So every time you see something like uh, why I recommend Linux Mint for new users is almost every article is written with apt in mind, usually sudo apt install. If it says sudo DNF install, usually that's Fedora. If it says Pac-Man or yay, those are the arch uh, branches of Linux. So just know that the package manager can change, but for the most part, you'll see apt the most. Go from update to upgrade and just type yes. And this will go out and update all our packages. You'll always do this every time on every operating system you ever install. Uh, using stuff right off of the disk is usually months, if not years old. So preaching to the choir here, but it's super important you do this on everything. All right, with our update done, we'll just reboot. Uh, typically with a really big update off the initial one, you need to reboot. Uh, but Linux is a little different than Windows in the regard that you don't need to reboot necessarily after every update. It just depends if uh, the kernel gets updated or not. Uh, so that's interesting. And here looks like a interesting little bug with probably Mint, that little loading there. Yeah, it's interesting. But let's start uh, customizing and doing things. We've already kind of gone through the first steps and you can do the theming. We've already done that. I want to talk about display for a second because sometimes display can get a little bit misunderstood. Display, a lot of times, I'll let us just blow this up, get a proper ratio. It can be set through system settings. It can be set by other programs. It doesn't necessarily have to be all in one spot. So let's uh, launch terminal. I'm going to install a program called a Randar, teach you a little bit about a different way of setting your resolution. So we can easily just launch a Randar. And this gives another uh, vis visual way of setting your resolution. So you could set it and then hit checkbox to manually do it. And you can actually save this out as a default uh, screen layout file. So if we quit this and we come into our home folder, let me blow that up, clear this. In our home folder, we go into screen layout and we just display what that file did, that def.sh. 
this is what ARANDAR made for us. It made us a nice little display file to where we could actually change this. And let's say we have this. Uh, oh, I don't have Vim installed. Uh, probably Nano is installed, the easiest editor. Vim, I don't recommend for newbies, but if you do want to get better productivity from basic file editing, learning Vim is huge. I highly recommend installing Vim and then do Vim Tutor. This actually walks you through how to do Vim and then you can do really cool stuff. But for today, uh, I just want to do Nano. Again, I kind of want to just show you all the doors to walk through and then leave you to walk through those doors. Uh, but if you want to just become a uh, average user, Nano works just fine. And we're going to edit that file. And this time we're going to just change the resolution to 1920 by 1080 uh, instead of the 1600 by 900. And we'll just control O, control X to write that out. And then if we do default, you'll notice changes our resolution for us. So just a different way of doing it, just to explain that the control centers and, and system settings, it's nice, but it's not the end all be all uh, of setting your resolution. There's other things and options that I want you to be thinking about what you like and don't like about this experience. The first is your file browser. How do you like this? Do you like this file browser? If you wanna change the theming or the colors, well, that's fine. You can do that through your settings like we did in themes. Let's just give those more of a blue look, a little bit better, but honestly, Nemo is not my favorite file manager. Uh, let's install something different. Let's uh, grab Thunar. It's a bit more minimal experience, but I, I kind of like it. And let's just do Thunar dots and it'll explain a little bit different, a little more compact. I like the spacing a bit better in Thunar, but let's say we want Nautilus instead. Again, uh, when it comes to Windows, you're stuck with Explorer. You can install like Files v2 on top of Explorer, but it's not the same. This actually can change the entire default app and you can purge what's here, which is kind of cool. So let's try Nautilus and you can see it looks a little bit different. I like the clean look of Nautilus though. I will say if you're really into aesthetics, I think Nautilus probably does the best job. But if you want just a lot of function, uh, so we'll do an apt install Dolphin. And you can see it's using a lot more stuff because its display and tool set is completely different from what we have just installed with uh, Nautilus and Nemo, where that was GTK based. You'll hear these acronyms, but GTK is a tool set to create graphic applications. And then there's QT, which is KDE, Dolphin, a couple other applications. Caden Live, I think, is QT as well. And that's a different tool set to create those graphic applications. Nothing standardized in Linux, so there's all these different tool sets. Uh, so you never, you know, it's it's a constant learning experience. Uh, I just kind of want to explain those two things, but let's uh, launch Dolphin so you can see it. And this is what Dolphin kind of looks like. Obviously, the thing's a bit off. We can fix that uh, and change some stuff. Obviously, it's not grabbing the blue themes, and it has some neat features like a terminal. Uh, which we don't have console installed to really get this looking properly. I think it's time to take that next step, which is to install KDE, which is a completely different desktop environment. This whole desktop suite with the system settings, the look and feel, all that is something called cinnamon. Well, we can do KDE. Let's just do an uh, apt search. Uh, Plasma. I think it's Plasma Desktop is the minimal one. I don't recommend doing like a KDE full because the problem with KDE and just to get a little bit behind the scenes, a lot of the apps that KDE installs is just hot garbage. Like their Discover store is not as good as Mint's, you know, their software uh, store. Also, a lot of their K apps uh, like Contacts with a K, all these things are just awful. They should probably just delete them and and get the stuff that most of the community actually uses. But KDE team still still develops those awful apps. I don't know why. Having said that, let's install Plasma Desktop. We can see that's a minimal set of applications. And if we did an apt search KDE full, that is a complete software thing. I highly recommend staying against the complete. Again, it's just too much garbage. Uh, so let's just do an apt install KDE Plasma desktop. And you can see this is a lot of packages, 600, almost 700 megs 
worth of packages. Still nothing compared to what you see in Windows and Mac, but hey, it's something. Now we touched a little bit on display managers. That's just think of it as a login manager. Uh, and we're going to switch this from LightDM, which is what the Cinnamon and Mint team uses, to SDDM. Now there's another one called GDM, which is based on GNOME. I'm not going to touch on GNOME because frankly, it's my least uh, favorite desktop environment, but this is what it looks like. It's not bad for those that want more of a Mac aesthetic. Uh, it's just not my jam. Now, if you do like KDE a lot better than Mint, this is where distributions kind of come in. While you can put a whole bunch of different desktop environments, it kind of gunks things up. You can see this is a lot of packages. I have a pretty powerful PC, but if I was running on like a netbook or a really low end PC, you don't typically want to install this many packages. And we're going to go through SDDM now and load into uh, KDE Plasma, which is a different desktop environment. Now from our login screen, you can see session. That's a desktop environment. Think of session as desktop environment. And you can see we have Plasma and we can type our password in. And this is what you're gonna see from a KDE Plasma. Even though Mint doesn't offer this spin, uh, it's still pretty functional for the most part. But let's theme this out a little bit, maybe uh, change some stuff. I First thing I don't like is their start menu. I think this is a little weird and hokey. So I'll just switch that to a more traditional start menu, come into settings. Usually I change the global theme. I really like Nordic. That's just my, uh, my preference, but pick whichever you want. You want something more flashy. They have like sweet KDE. That's pretty awesome. This will usually prompt uh, a couple times and just, you just need to enter your super user password to install this globally because this will change the login theme. It'll change the actual desktop theme. It kind of changes everything all in one go. That's uh, one thing I think KDE does a little bit better than most other desktop environments. All right, with that installed, we can just select Nordic, hit apply. Boom, done. Let's fix startup and shutdown. Switch that over to Nordic as well. All right, that's done. Desktop sessions, another thing KDE doesn't do great. I don't like to confirm my logout and I don't ever want to restore a previous session. Uh, so starting with empty, this usually causes your shutdowns to take forever in KDE. Splash screen, that's on Nordic. And then probably go into system settings, show you that a little bit. We'll go down into display. Let's see if we can't change it to like a 1080 display. And ah, kind of flip back. And also obviously coming from Mint, this is probably not the recommended way. If you really like this aesthetic, I would highly recommend you check out like Ubuntu. Uh, it would be a good first KDE distro. So let's uh, hit the restart button and come back. All right. And here we are. Obviously a lot better login screen than that ugly thing we were doing. We log in. We have a lot better aesthetic. We could change our desktop, probably do some Bali. And then we have a nice opaque uh, start menu that just makes sense. Uh, one other thing I probably would do here is hit alt space to run K runner at the top and settings. And we're just going to go down to system settings. Some of the icons are missing. So probably would fix that with just switching this to either breeze dark. That's a pretty good one. That's base. Or uh, I like papyrus a lot, which is uh, down here. Or we could switch to a Nordic bluish tint. I think that would be good as well. And then this will fill in on a logout and logging back in. Again, a lot of things in Linux can be done by just simply logging out, logging back in. You don't necessarily need to reboot, which is quite nice. Uh, you still have a lot of the functionality of Mint here with a KDE skin. Obviously, this isn't recommended, but I want to show you one more thing too, which is, well, I'm doing all this from a VM. So... Typically, I'll just shut this guy down. And once this goes down, I could boot into Windows. Uh, I highly recommend at least having a Windows VM for programs that you're like, oh, wait, I got to get this or that. Uh, maybe like a Adobe document for my work. Uh, I need to do some bait stamping in a Adobe portfolio or something like that. I I'm going to need Windows for that. And I'm going to have to load that up. So I'll that's what my Windows VMs for. This is my setup. It's a basic Debian setup, meaning I installed it from server. There's no desktop environment. 
everything here is custom. If I change my resolution or any of that, well, I'm just going in here and just typing the commands to do that, quitting out, everything's done with a hotkey. Uh, very, very productive if I want to go about doing it this method. And the thing I wanna leave you with is when it comes to using Linux, always be thinking of Linux alternatives. Don't come in expecting it to work like how Windows works. When it comes to gaming, it works a bit different. It, it, you install stuff differently. Everything is different. Learn that different method because if you expect it to work like Windows and you're not willing to learn, Linux is not for you. And that's just kind of how it all works. I still use Windows and I still use Mac and I still use Linux. Uh, obviously, Linux is my main daily driver that I love to do it because I'm so productive where when I'm on Mac and Windows, it feels slower because it is slower. And I can do global hotkeys in Linux for everything. And you just don't have that functionality because it's so locked down. But you have support in Windows and Mac and you just, you're kind of on your own in Linux. And I wanted to just show you all the doors today so you can walk through them. Let me know down below all the things that you missed because those comments are how I, um, succeed and learn new things. The comments are how I was able to learn all this stuff in just a short period of a couple years. And with that, I want to thank everybody and I'll see you in the next one.